You recently wrote regarding the debt crisis, facing down the military industrial lobby is the vital first step in putting America's fiscal house in order. Let's start there. Why do you think that's the first thing or spending you would attack to restore sort of fiscal sanity? Well, we've just been in one war after another. The military budget is uh, out of sight and uh, it's got a lot of bipartisan support for even more spending. So I, I regard this as something we actually should think about after wasting so much money in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, and now Ukraine. Maybe, maybe there could be some sensible discussion. But the way our government works is uh, that each, each part of public policy, so-called, is parceled out to the special lobbies. This one goes to the military-industrial complex. It's got a strong constituency in Congress, and there's really no debate about any of this stuff. So that, that was really the purpose of the article, to say, look, we've spent maybe six to eight trillion by now on these wasted wars. Uh, we, we never look backwards in this country. You know, that's, a, that's part of our national trait. Never think about what just happened, uh, just plow ahead. And um, six to eight trillion by, I think, a reasonable calculation is perhaps half of the total increase of the publicly held debt uh, from 2000 till now. I show a little arithmetic on that point. And so we ought to contemplate uh, we're in it deep in another wasteful and destructive effort, and we should um, sort this out. So just just for the purposes of the discussion and some pushback, we have an ascendant China spending more and more money on its military. Even places like Saudi Arabia are, they're increasing their military budget 16% a year. We have an, obviously a very aggressive Russia, a land war in Europe. Is this a time to be cutting military spending? Or, I mean, is it, there's deficiency, the are there better ways to spend the money? And then there's the overall budget. But at, what is it, 12 or 13% of our budget? Is, is military spending the, really the place to start in terms of fiscal responsibility? Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, we all know the prisoner's dilemma uh, situation where um, it's individually rational, say, for the U.S. to engage in an arms race and maybe individually rational for China to engage in an arms race, and yet the uh, outcome is absurd for both countries and very dangerous, actually. The, the way you get out of a prisoner's dilemma is you actually talk with each other, and that's, that's the one thing we're not allowed to do right now. So the whole setup of how we think about these things is phony, to my mind, first of all, and extremely destructive. The idea of the prisoner's dilemma, which we teach in school to our students year after year for the last 70 years uh, is that um, if you don't talk to the other side and realize that you're stuck, it's called a dilemma because you're stuck with a terrible outcome, you'll, you'll end up with that outcome. But we could actually talk to the other side and say, you know, this mutual arms race is, is, is really absurd. Of course, China thinks they're just being defensive because they say, look, we're spending one third of what the United States spends. You go to Washington, which unfortunately I have to do once in a while and listen to these politicians, and it's drumbeats of war everywhere. And so the Chinese say, well, we've got to do this. This is our defense. And then the United States says, oh, China is increasing its spending. We, we need to do the same thing. That's a prisoner's dilemma. But I would say for Americans, it's good to know we're spending three times more than the Chinese right now. The U.S. military spending is more than the next 10 countries combined. If you want to get a, a good recent accounting of this, there's an organization in Stockholm, uh, Stockholm Institute of Peace Research. I have it wrong. Uh, some, somehow I've dropped an I in that. It's Cipri. But you can find it online, their recent report showing $2.2 trillion of military spending. The United States is 40% of the world total, though we are 4% of the world population. I, I think uh, we've got some scope to uh, do this in a more rational way.
So I think that's a really important point. And it's it's funny you're saying that because I, I have in front of me the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. And just to look at some of the numbers, United States spends 877 billion. China, number two, spends 292. And if you look at the top 10 spenders, I think you'd argue six or seven of the 10 that were, there were allies. That even the 877 number is a bit misleading because if you think about Western or OECD countries that are largely coordinating with each other, we dwarf the rest. And your belief is that if we sat down and said, okay, China and Russia, and I don't know if you consider India and Saudi Arabia sort of swing votes, this is out of control. We all have better ways to spend our money, similar to what we did with nuclear arms or nuclear missiles, where we took them from 50,000 to 10,000. We're all going to start reducing our military budget. Is that Would that be a good starting place? I, I think a, a really good starting place would be the idea that uh, first, we shouldn't be aiming to blow each other up because behind all of this is uh, even a, a more destructive point than the budget, which is the mindset. The mindset right now in the US is China's an enemy. Uh, war is very likely, which is, I can't even believe that, but that's actually what is thought in Washington, that war is likely. And this mindset that we're aiming or we're heading for conflict is relatively new, extraordinarily wrongheaded, easily avoidable. You know, a good way to avoid it is for Nancy Pelosi not to fly to Taiwan, for example. I mean, you don't just stick the thumb in the eye of your counterpart and expect everything's going to work out fine. You actually, you don't freeze dialogue like the Biden administration did when it came into office. You know, there was an order in the government, don't talk to your Chinese counterparts. Uh, that was for most of the first year of the administration. Uh, you don't say, we're cutting you off from all advanced technology uh, in every way we can and roll out the old containment playbook and expect that you're going to have any kind of peaceful relations. So I think even deeper than the budget issue, though the way you put it is exactly right, is a mindset issue. We're in the prisoner's dilemma in a most naive way, which is we think we know that they are going to be aggressive, so we're going to be aggressive back. And that's the mindset right now. And it's uh, completely wrongheaded. Do you think some of this chill, though, in, in U.S.-China relations is, uh, I think China, I used to go to China a lot. And I think if she as, um, or China is a different place than it was 10 years ago, and that she's rise to power, that it's, a, that it's an autocracy, that they've actually been quite aggressive, and that us going to Taiwan, who has been an ally, a strategic ally, we do great trade with them, and that no one should intimidate us into having our representatives visit Taiwan. Uh, it just strikes me that you're not holding both parties accountable for the chill here in relations. No, I, I think it's actually something different, which is a more kind of a international realist approach, which is that starting around 2012, you could really date it to around 2014, China reached a a, a new level of its economic development. You know, during the period from 1980 to 2010, arguably, China became the world's manufacturing workshop. But the idea was, okay, we have the technologies, they have the low-cost labor, uh, and uh, this is a great relationship. We're going to get a lot of low-cost uh, iPhones out of this, and and this is this is good. But Chinese, extremely clever and extremely capable, they started uh, minting hundreds of thousands of PhDs per year. And what really freaked out the American policymakers was two things that came around 2014. I'd say number one was a program in China called Made in China 2025, where China used terms that I would not have advised them to use, but they said, we're going to we're going to, I don't know if it's dominate, but you know, we're going to be the major players in a lot of key technologies by 2025. So that was one thing. And it really freaked out Washington. And the second was 
uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And the Belt and Road Initiative was China saying, we're the phenomenal world savers. Uh, while the United States barely saves, uh, we save 40% of our gross domestic product or more. And we're going to use those savings to build highways, fast rail, 5G, all over Eurasia. And by the way, even in East Africa, Latin America, and that's the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, we don't have any initiatives like that. 50 years ago, we would have, but now the United States doesn't. So these two things were kind of an announcement. China's reaching a level of superpower status in the world and a superpower of 1.4 billion people and a highly successful society. At that point, you start finding remarkable statements. It didn't have to do with Xi. Uh, it, 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 and it didn't have to do with anything specific uh, about putting up some military facilities on a tiny uh, island in the South China Sea, nothing like that. It had to do with the recognition that China was now a threat to U.S. dominance. And there's a remarkable paper by a former colleague of mine, Ambassador Robert Blackwell, uh, who wrote, I think it's 2015, the Council on Foreign Relations, people can download it, that the United States needs to rethink its relations with China because China is now a threat to U.S. predominance or U.S. dominance. And he lays out a number of steps in that paper very clearly, we need to restrict technology flows. We need to organize countries in Asia to uh, engage and trade with us in ways that deliberately exclude the Chinese from uh, any role in policymaking. Uh, and he lays out quite explicitly a kind of neo-containment strategy, if I could call it that. So that's when the U.S. started to move. It started under Trump, but Biden has accelerated it. Uh, and uh, I think it's just wrong to think that somehow this was provoked by Xi. It was provoked by China's continued rise in excellence, in innovation, in science and technology. And it was provoked by the good old U.S. idea that, hey, this is our century, nobody else's century, and we're not going to let it happen. Now, I, I happen to think that's a ridiculous approach to life because as an economist, I guess, maybe as a human being, I believe in win-win ideas. I don't believe that this is really a game of who's on top, but actually, are we prospering, which is not a, a zero-sum idea, but more of a, a shared idea. Um, and I regard that whole shift in U.S. politics as being dangerous and wrongheaded, sure to create an enemy uh, of the other side. And just if I could you know, finish on this thought, one of my favorite political scientists is John Mearsheimer, who is our kind of go-to super realist uh, at the University of Chicago. And he, he wrote a very powerful, very influential book in the early 2000s called The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. And in the early 2000s, when he wrote, he said, you know, it looks calm right now. Uh, it looks like, uh, you know, we're past great power crisis. But he writes very uh, presciently, when China grows in power, we're going to be right back to great power conflict. And I give him a lot of credit for it. But I, I said to him, uh, John, this is going to lead to self-fulfilling crisis. He said, yes. And I said, John, that's a tragedy. Yes. He said, that's how it is. And, and I, I don't accept that part, that we have to have a tragic outcome to all of this.